Okay, like I was saying, I say good afternoon, or we're still in the morning. Okay, almost afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, please let's listen to this lecture. Don't unmute your mic. Despite that, people still uh, unmute their mic. Uh, see how difficult it can be to control. Yes, uh, occlusion and disruption is the topic before us that we're, I'm going to be treating today. And I expect everybody to pay attention. Don't come online and waste your time. If you are making noise, you are wasting your time. Please pay attention. This lecture, I've taken your attendance already. But if you have not written your name, please do so in the chat box so that you can uh, listen and I, we can get your attendance. If this is your first time of joining an online uh, video lecture, I know you'll be playing with a lot of things, but can't you spare us a while now so that we can really concentrate and you gain something for one hour or less that we're going to be together. Very important, very, very important. Please, don't unmute your mic for the time I'm speaking. Now, the occlusion, occlusion and dysfunction. And when we're talking about occlusion, occlusion is not only in dentistry, but this is occlusion in dentistry. Occlusion means coming together, like I said, and dysfunctions are the problems that are associated with occlusion. Now, I said in the learning objective, by the end of this lecture, you should be able to define and understand as it applies to artificial and natural dentition, then you should be able to identify different dysfunctions associated with occlusion. You will be able to identify angles that Edward Angles classification of occlusion. Edward Angles is modern, is regarded as the, uh, the father of modern orthodontists. You will know what his classification of occlusion is. Identify components of occlusion, objectives of occlusion, and there are some terms I put together that you'll be able to see. What is, what occlusion is and what it is not. Occlusion is about relationship between upper and lower jaws, involving the teeth and all associated members of the oral cavity. I take that again. Occlusion is about relationship between upper and lower jaw, where the teeth and associated members of the oral cavity is involved. Okay, so, um, and the oral cavity, the associated members of the oral cavity that are involved include the mucosa, the alveolar ridge, the temporal mandibular joint, short form TMJ, the muscles of manifestation, the bones, and Mal occlusion is incorrect. That is the opposite of occlusion. That is what occlusion is not. It's incorrect and misalignment relation between the ashes when they are approaching occlusion, when they are trying to come together. That is mal occlusion. Incorrect uh, or misalignment relation between the ashes when they are approaching each other, when they are about closing. That is a mal occlusion. So let's begin like this. Occlusion can be considered as natural. We are talking of occlusion, that natural occlusion evolved when a patient has all his teeth in place. No exception. That is natural occlusion. Artificial occlusion is, all, is evolved when a patient wears denture, full foot, upper and lower uh, denture. They will call it artificial occlusion. Now, what are the objectives of occlusion? The objective of occlusion is to replace teeth and to preserve the residual reach. These are the two main ones. There are more. Okay. What are the components of occlusion? I told you the tooth, the old groups of teeth in dental ashes. That is when you consider the teeth in the lower ash and the upper ash as a group. That is 
one component of the brain. Then the relationship between the ashes, when they're in centric or eccentric position, then you look at the temporal mandibular joint. The temporal mandibular joint, you get to know, is that joint that connected the lower jaw to the skull. Definition of types of occlusion. Definitions of types of occlusion. Occlusion is about contact between maxillary and mandibular teeth. I told you earlier it's about the ashes coming together involving the teeth. And this happens when a patient is chewing and when the jaws are in rest position. So we can recognize centric occlusion, which means a static relationship. The eccentric relationship is, I mean, eccentric occlusion is a dynamic relationship between the upper and the white jaw. So when you are sure, for example, there's mobility in the jaws, that is eccentric relationship. But when the, the jaws are in rest position, that is, they came together, that is centric occlusion. Then centric relation. Scientists are in, 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 in doubt about what should be the stable meaning of centric relation. But I put this together for you so that you can uh, understand. Because even the subject of occlusion is a controversial subject. So people, I mean dentists, professionals have different concepts of occlusion. So what is centric relation? Central relation is defined as jaw to jaw contact. When the upper and lower jaws are in contact, that is centric relationship. And this usually happens when teeth are not involved, when it is an identical loss case. Centric occlusion is tooth to tooth relationship. That is when the teeth are in contact. That is centric occlusion. Centric occlusion and Centric relation, relationship is when we are considering the relationship between an upper, upper and lower teeth when they are fully dented. So, when centric occlusion and central relation can only happen when the teeth of upper and lower are in occlusion, they are acting together. That is what, when we have centric occlusion and centric relation. Then, what is balanced occlusion? is also a static relationship that exists between the incising and occlusal surfaces of maxillary and mandibular teeth. Balance occlusion, I take that again, is a static relationship when the maxillary surfaces and the incising edges of maxillary and mandibular teeth are in contact. That is balanced occlusion. Balanced occlusion uh, articulation is different. It's a bilateral uh, simultaneous occlusal contact of the anterior and posterior teeth when they are in excursive movement. Lateral excursion, where they are, when, when, for example, you are showing, you are biting, and the teeth are, I mean, the jaws are moved uh, against themselves. That is balanced articulation. Okay, we move forward now. Um, I try to show you here bilateral balance dental occlusion with anatomic position dental teeth. You will see in the image, you see the relationship between the upper and lower teeth. This is protrusive. This is a protrusive relationship. And you see the balancing relationship there. You can see that, you can see gap between the incisor, incisor edges of the teeth. You can see they are not making contact. And the working relationship is when they are in full contact. It's similar to centric relationship. Though not exactly, because centric is not dynamic. The working relationship is dynamic. I just try to show you so that you can see the difference pictorially. You are familiar with this? And that's, this will be of serious help to you. 
this is overjet and overbite. Because when you are talking of relationship, which is all about occlusion, you should understand the relationship between the upper and lower anterior, relationship between the lower and upper posterior. And in defining the, the relationship between upper anterior and lower uh, anterior, you talk of overjet and you talk of overbite. Some of you are very familiar with this. So the overbite and overjet relationship are, are very important when you are considering occlusion. So you can see how it is measured there. The overbite is vertical overlap, while overjet is a horizontal overlap. You see how they are measured there. So very important that you uh, take note of this. Uh, again, there's a very relevant uh, uh, definition here that will help you to understand occlusion. This is incisor guidance. Incisor guidance is an angle formed by, by the horizontal and vertical overlap of anterior teeth in relation to a horizontal plane. Let's say we draw a, a, a horizontal plane, a line that is crossing the incisor edges of the upper anterior. And we, we take another line to that bisected it that is taking the angulation of the anterior upper. When we look at it, the angle that is formed by these two lines is called uh, incisor guidance angle. So when it is not, when it is so wide, when it is still so low, I mean, so close, there are different uh, occlusions that are guided by that. Now let us look at this, the third image. That is image uh, C. It may see is showing us uh, zero incisor guidance. In this case, there is no incisor guidance at all. In A, there is steep incisor guidance. In B, there's medium incisor guidance. Why is this knowledge important to you? They're important in that it is only when you have the understanding of the relationship of upper and lower anterior teeth that you'll be able to understand what occlusion is. Because occlusion is about contact between the upper teeth and lower teeth, regardless of whether they are posterior or anterior teeth. So that incisor guidance angle for you, it is formed by horizontal and vertical overlap of the anterior teeth in relation to a horizontal plane. We move. Now, this will help you to understand also the different curves of uh, a typical posterior teeth. A curve is an eminence on a tooth. It's an eminence on a tooth. Curves it can be posterior, it can be anterior. These are, let me say, projection, elevation on a tooth. And this uh, image shows you a lot about how to understand different sides of all these curves. Until you understand them, it will be difficult for you to be able to define occlusion and understand it. Of course, you know that we have to a tooth, we have a buccal surface, we have a lingual surface, we have a distal surface, then we have a mesial surface. So the mesial pit, the, the mesolingual corpse, the lingual groove, uh, the disolingual group, uh, groups, everywhere, every side or every surface of a tooth is defined by the name of that surface. If it is lingua, you are going to define it according to that side of the tooth. That is where you have distolingua curves, distolingua group. If it is buca, you are going to be talking about buca, uh, buca group, distal buca uh, uh, curves, uh, mesial buca curves. If it is distal, so and so on, distal curves, distal buca curves. Now, area nearest to the buca area, but it's also close also to the distal end. And you know the distal end is any area away from the, uh, from the midline. So the understanding of these different corpses and the fact that 
a tooth typically has four sides. The additional one will be the occlusal surface. Show to you uh, a clear understanding of how you can understand uh, occlusion. So you know that I told you earlier, curves are eminences of, on a tooth. Canine has its own, just one. Femola have two, and molars have four or five. Depends on the tooth you are dealing with. So every tooth has its own, uh, has its own uh, eminence, and they are so defined. Now we talk of Angus, Edward Angus classification of malocclusion. Edward Angle is reputed to be the father of modern orthodontics. And he has so designed classification of malocclusion. And he defines it as the relative position of permanent maxillary first molar. So the reference points that Edward Angle used in defining class of malocclusion is the first permanent maxillary molar. That is the reference point. You get to know in the course of this lecture where what that means. The canine can also be used to define uh, malocclusion, where the first permanent maxillary uh, teeth are missing, uh, tooth is missing. So, and he defined this, that uh, the class one of malocclusion as when in relation to the incisor now, as mandibular incisor when it makes contact with the maxillary incisor in the middle third or on the cingulum of the palatal surface. So when there's a surface, when the, uh, the, the incisor of lower is making contact with the third of the palatal surface of upper anterior is class one relationship. You get it clearer as we move along. The class two is mandibular incisor contact, the maxillary incisor on the palatal surface, in the gingiva tort or posterior to the, uh, to the singular. This class may be further divided into two. I think you need to understand and read this one often. Includes maxillary incisor, which are proclined for 90%. You need just to know this because there's no way you measure 90%, but just to know how uh, the different uh, classification or subdivision rather of class two of angles uh, classification of malocclusion. Then you take of division two, which includes retroclined by 10% of the incisor. So, and that leads to decrease of uh, the particle overlap. It is rather termed as overbite. Okay, then um, the class three malocclusion is mandibular incisor occlude with this maxillary incisor on the palatal surface in the incisor tort, basically, or anterior to the cingulum. These are very technical things that we need to understand and be able to uh, link them, sometimes offhand, so that if the question is asked, you'll be able to answer them very well. But this will become clearer to you as we go along. So, uh, this is Edward Angus classification of malocclusion. You can see the picture there. You can see the picture there, the class one, the class two, the class three. Class one, class two, class three. Class one, we previously have defined it, is the medulla first molar when it occludes mesially to the maxillary first molar. You know, we talk about the anterior previous, but now we are talking of the, uh, the relationship between the, uh, the posterior. You know, I told you earlier that Edward Angus' clarification of malocclusion takes the first maxillary, uh, maxillary molar as the reference point or the canine. So, Mandibular first molar when it occludes mesially to the maxillary first molar with the mesobuchal cups of maxillary first molar occluding in the buchal groove of the mandibular first. 
you can see what we're talking about now. The mandibular first molar occludes mesially to the maxillary first molar. You can see the relationship in, in, the, in the image here. I believe everybody can see the image. You can see the image that the mandibular first molar occludes mesially, mesially to the maxillary first molar. That is class one. Class two is mesobuchal cups. The mesobuchal cups, you can see it here, of the maxillary first molar, occludes anterior to the buchal groove or the mandibular first molar. You can see it here. The mesobuchal cups. You know, I told you earlier that you name a, a corpse as per the surface of the tube. Mesobuchal. That is nearest the middle line, nearest the buccal side. So the mesobuchal curves of the maxillary here, see where it is lying, that is of the first molar, where it's occluding anterior to the groove of the mandibular first molar. Now, you see that the mandibular first molar here is going, is backward. Why? Let me use that language so I can understand it. Why the maxillary first molar is moving anterior? That is the description is trying to give you there. That is the mesobuchal cups of the maxillary first molar. Where is the maxillary first molar? You can see my pointer. That is it. Occludes anterior. You see now, the mesobuchal cups here is this. If you can see my pointer, is occluding anterior to the buca groove of the mandibular first molar. The groove is the line that tends to divide the teeth or a tooth into two. So when this uh, mesobuca cups is occluding of the maxillary first molar, is occluding anterior to the buca groups of the mandibular first molar, then you define that as class two man occlusion according to Edwards Angus uh, classification. Of malocclusion. Then this the third um, the third class of malocclusion is you see that it's like completely the first maxillary molar is almost off the surface of the first mandibular molar. That is class three. See the definition. If the mesobuca cups, where is the mesobuca cups? That is when the line is crossing in the third class. If the mesiobuchal cups of the, of the maxillary first molar occludes posterior, posterior to the groove, groove of the first mandibular first molar, then you define that as class three. You can see the decision. The picture should be able to show you a clearer understanding of this relationship. You know, we consider that of upper before or upper anterior before. Then we are considering that of a, a posterior. That will give you a picture of what it looks like. Let's go further to the next slide. Now you will get a clearer picture here too. Um, here you can see the relationship: class one, class two, class three. You recall that the last one we just said, the class three, that the maxillary first molar is almost not biting on the mandibular first molar. That is class three. The class two, the maxillary first molar is anterior to mandibular first molar. In other words, the groove of maxillary first molar is anterior to the, to the groove, I mean, the cups, the mesobuchal cups of the, uh, and, I mean, uh, maxillary first molar is, is anterior, it's biting anterior to the groove of the first mandibular first molar. So, this picture shows it clearly to you. 
Why the class one, which is a normal relationship, is when the Messio Booker Court is biting on the group of, that is of the upper, on the group of the lower, the first molar, the lower. This gives you a clearer picture. You can see the relationship there. That is Edward Angus classification of uh, uh, malocclusion. Let's look further. This is a dynamic relationship. You see how the animation is changing. Can you see? That is class three. Where it is now is class three. This is class three. Then this is class one. This is class two. You can see that relationship. And you know the reference point in all these cases is always the first maxillary permanent molar. This animation shows you the relationship. And you, you, if you observe very well, in the class three, you see how the lower anterior is overlapping the upper. And here, the overlapping of class two is so pronounced. So the overbite and overjet will continue to change each time that you are considering uh, the Edwards classification of malocclusion. I believe that should be clear to many of us. Okay. Um, another, another important concept about malocclusion that you need to understand about occlusion, rather, not malocclusion, is curve of speed. Many times people don't understand what curve of speed is. Curve of speed is when you are describing this curve in relation to natural dentition. But when it is artificial dentition, that is prosthetic occlusion, you are talking of compensating curve. People used to mix them together. Curve of speed, compensating curve are same, virtually the same. The difference is that curve of speed applies to natural dentition. When you are describing this curve, in relation to natural dentition, you call it curve of speed. But when it is involving prosthetic occlusion, that is where the patient is wearing denture, then it is called compensative curve. Please, let's take note of this important concept. They are all very important in our understanding of the, uh, the concept of occlusion. There we are here, plane of occlusion. Plane of occlusion is also a line that is connecting the teeth of your incisor to distobuca cups of the most posterior teeth on either side of the arch. You can see it, that is a line from the anterior. It's making like a, a triangular shape, connecting the first, uh, the, 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 uh, the distobuca cups of the posterior, the last posterior, the second molar on one side to second molar on the other side. That is plane of occlusion. Cough of wheezing. Cough of wheezing is the booger cups of mandibular posterior teeth when they are slightly, they are generally slightly higher. The booger cups of mandibular posterior teeth. They are usually higher than the lingua cups. So if you take a line from the buccal cups of any, any posterior, and you try to draw it, if it connects with the lingua cups, the buccal cups, you are taking the line from the buccal cups now, it's connecting with the line with the cups of the, uh, the buccal cups, I mean, the lingua cups rather. It is going to descend down, that line will descend down to touch it. And if we continue this line to join, that is on one side of the arch, to join the lingua cups on the opposite side of the arch, that line goes up. 
and to further touch the Buka courts of the posterior teeth on the other side of the arch, it goes up. So if you look at the line, the line is when it's touching the Buka courts of both sides and the Ligua courts, the line is going to form uh, a, a, a kind of a shape. You're going to coin a saucer kind of shape. And that shape, that curve is called curve of wisdom. Let me read this. Therefore, a line drawing, drawn touching the Buka curves, the lingua curves of same tooth on one side of the ash, if extended to touch the lingua and Buka curves of the tooth of opposing side of the same ash, is called curve of wisdom. Now you can know the decision between the two now, the curve of speed, the curve of wisdom. Let me, let me go back to curve of uh, speed. All posterior curves do not touch the occlusal plane, but conform to a gentle anterior posterior curve known as curve of speed. So the curve of speed is a line. It draws a, usually an imaginary line drawn from the anterior. It touches the focal curve of the mandibular uh, posterior and it goes off like that. That curve is called curve of P. And these curves are very important to your understanding as a student of occlusion and of, uh, it, they also help you when you are searching up so that you know which tooth that is going to be, which curve is going to be raised up and so on and so forth. And which one is going to go down. The different angulation and position of your setup is determined by all these uh, curves. Now, curve of wisdom, we have defined it. Then this is further defining uh, the curve of P and of uh, Mozul. Now, the B here, the lateral curve, this is showing you what I just described about curve of wisdom. You see, the line takes off from the Booker curve of these two. You can see my uh, pointer. And it's touching the uh, lingua cost. I told you the Booker cost should always be higher than the um, lingua cost. And it continues, that line continues, and it's touching the lingua cost on the opposite side of the uh, ash. And it's touching the Booker cost. This curve is called curve of wasting. Where this the A is the line that is the imaginary line, they're usually a marginal line, that is taken off from the anterior, touching the buccal cups of all the posterior, and your setup should definitely reflect this. That is curve of speed. Your setup should reflect this. That is what will make your setup fine and good. So take note of that in all your setup. Now, the subject of occlusion, like I said, is very controversial. What is normal, what is abnormal is hard to define. So, but the clinician will always know what is suitable for a patient and be able to work hard to ensure that they implement the right occlusion for the patient. There's no one bad occlusion. It's difficult to say this is a bad occlusion. It is difficult to say this is good occlusion. The amount of the patient will define uh, a lot and will determine a lot what occlusion will be. Now, that is uh, occlusion and dysfunction for you. We'll be on for some minutes now, and I believe I am communicating with uh, so many members of this class. Um, now, are we? Expect that you ladies and gentlemen, I will expect that you will be able to ask me questions before I ask you questions about uh, today's lecture. It's a short one. We didn't spend much time. So please. Let me welcome your questions. 
you can unmute or mute your mic, then speak to me. Let's share together on this subject of occlusion. Or if there's any uh, of the any part of the lecture that you don't understand, be free to let me know so that we can talk it together. And if for uh, um okay you want me to come back again that is uh abdul tali i don't know you want me to go over everything again or specific slides please let me know what exactly you are saying uh for anyone who could not speak maybe your network or for whatever reason you are free to type just like abdul talib just did now type your a uh, question or your concern into the chat box then i will see it and be able to attend to uh, your question if you're not so free to make statement there please do so so that we can understand ourselves abdul matalib i'm still waiting to hear from you whether you want me to go over all the slides again or you want specific slide you want me to explain to you because i only see come back again please sir uh, okay i don't understand edward angles sir. uh edward angles um uh, classification okay do i see baba today yes we will take that can i get more questions too Okay. Um, don't chat privately, chat directly. Because I will still say it, and everybody will know that you ask that question. So, um, okay. Um, okay, cough of Munzun. That is what, um, okay, so I don't understand. The occlusion, okay. So how can class two malocclusion be corrected on a partial denture? Okay. Okay. Let me do something now. Let me take it one after the other. Let me take that of uh, Isaac Babatunde again. Uh, we will be able to understand. Uh, let me share the screen so that. Uh, we can understand, we can look at it together. Uh, I'm coming to share the screen with you again so that you can see it together. You want to know what uh, angles, Edward's angle classification of pollution is. But before I share that, let me start uh, saying that to you, that angles divided malocclusion into three, the class one, the class two, the class three malocclusion. I guess you, you mean that you don't understand any of them. But let me uh, try to put them forward to you again, what uh, Agu is saying. I say Andrew, Andrew, I mean Edward Angle. He started to say that Edward Angle is uh, divided malocclusion into three. And uh, we define malocclusion by starting with the anterior and the mandibular relationship. I mean, posterior relationship of the teeth. You know, when you're talking of occlusion, is involving, like I said earlier, the teeth, the anterior teeth, the posterior teeth, of upper and lower arches. So it is not just uh, about anterior teeth alone, it's not about posterior teeth alone. But let me take you to a, let me take you to that, uh, let me take you to that, uh, to that animation. Let me take you to the animation so that you can understand me.
Now you can see now. I will take you to the animation that explains the solution to you. This is the animation that explains the, the Edward occlusion, Edward classification of occlusion. Okay, sorry. Like I told you, this is class two. Begin to understand it this way. Sorry for the break in transmission. You can see. You can see the Edward Angus classifications of mal occlusion. Like I said to the person who asked the question, it's divided into two, I mean into three. We have the class three, class two, class one. Class two, uh, class one, class two, class three. Um, okay, let's move now. I want the animation to show. Now, if you are looking at the relationship, this class two, you will see the anterior is coming out more. Then look at the class three. The anterior of lower is coming out far more than that of upper. It's not the normal jaw relationship. This is the class two. The anterior of upper is projecting more. The class three, the anterior of lower is projecting further. In normal relationship, you see that the overjet and overbite is, is okay. So that is how angles classify uh, malocclusion. You will notice that each time there is this, at this animation shows, if you look at this side, the, beside the head, beside the head of the man here, you will see the relationship of the anterior. The relationship of the arterial is trying to explain to you what class is. Now, but let me take it further and explain to you. This is the procedure. In class one, this is a normal jaw relationship. In this case, the Misiobuka cups. Misiobuka cups. If you can see my pointer, the Misiobuka cups is rest of the maxillary first molar. Sorry, when I say Mr. Booker Cops, I'm talking of lower and upper and lower because Edwards takes first molar of the upper as a reference point, just as canine too. So the Mr. Booker Cops of the upper is engaging the groove of that of the lower. You can see the relationship and is engaging it posteriorly. Now, the distobuka corpse is partially making contact with the distobuka corpse of the lower. That is class one, and it's a normal relationship. Class two is abnormal. In this case, the distobuka corpse of the upper is anterior to that of lower. So you see that the uh, Mesiobuka corpse is like completely off the surface of that of lower. If you look at it classically, it's like the corpse, the Mesiobuka corpse is almost completely off the surface of that of lower. That is defining the uh, uh, Edward Angus classification from the perspective of, from the perspective of the procedure. Now, if you look at this animation, if you look at the procedure, I mean the anterior, you see that 
Each time it is class three, the lower anterior is always forward. Whereas the upper anterior in class two is usually forward, projecting forward. It's an unusual relationship. I think I've dealt with that. Let, let us go to Muzun, which uh, Abdul Muttalib asks about. This is curve of Muzun. The curve of Muzun, let me put it this way, it will be better understood here. This is curve of Muzun. I told you curve of Muzun, that line, the line that joins the Buka curves on one side of the arch to the lingual curves of the same tube on one side of an arch. And it runs straight to join the lingual curves of the other side of the arch and join the Buka curves. That curve, if you draw that line, that line is known as curve of monsoon. That is curve of monsoon. So it's different from curve of speed. Curve of speed is also an imaginary line that touches the canine, the anterior, and it touches the buccal cups and it goes to the last molar. They are usually like a trough. That is curve of speed. You try to know the decision now. Okay, let's go further to other questions that some people have asked. Um, I'm trying to look up your, your question now. Somebody raise up his hand. You know, I will be to connect with that person now. So I'm trying to get your chat so that I can attend to. Somebody asked me, how do you collect um, in a partial denture? I think Shinoki, Shinoki also, they're trying to ask me, how do you collect a malocution? Sorry, we are dealing with internet, and internet can be so erratic sometimes. I'm trying to see the chat so that I can deal with the question of everyone here. Uh, sorry. Okay, please, you have to ask that question again, because I discovered that each time it goes off, the chat will be wiped off. So, but Ademola, um, said, can we get the PDF of this um, presentation? Of course, even the video will be available for you to listen to me again. So uh, you'll be able to get it. But you know you can't get PDF now. Uh, if you can get the video, I think it's better. The video will explain everything to you. OK, so uh, if I have dealt with your questions satisfactorily, if you can speak, speak. If not, just type there and say uh, you are satisfied. So I will know you have dealt with it appropriately. Okay. Um, somebody said occlusion. That is Tijani Naimot. Occlusion is about relationship between upper and lower when they are in contact. And I told you we have centric occlusion, we have a centric occlusion. I said centric occlusion is when there's maximum intercospation, when they are in firm contact, and usually, con uh, usually static. That uh, centric occlusion is a static relationship. 